So now we're going to continue on, and I'm pleased to introduce the 2018 presidential lecturer. Dr. Francis Collins is a physician geneticist noted for his landmark discoveries of disease genes and his leadership of the International Human Genome Project. He served as director of the National Human Genome Research Institute and in NIH from 1993 to 2008 before becoming director of the National Institutes of Health in 2009. In April of 2003, he led the international effort that completed the sequencing of the human genome. This accomplishment is likely one of the biggest scientific breakthroughs of our lifetime. Before coming to NIH, Dr. Collins was a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at the University of Michigan. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences, was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in November 2007, and received the National Medal of Science in 2009. As director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Collins oversees the work of the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world, spanning the spectrum from basic to clinical research. Our members and our patients are forever grateful for the translational discoveries supported by the NIH that have paved the way for a brighter future for numerous neurological conditions. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Oh, Francis? What? You can't make it? Oh, no. You better have a good excuse. You're with the Pope at the Vatican? on a special high-level meeting on technology and science? Well, that sounds like a good excuse. Okay, thanks for letting me know. Sorry, change of plans. Unfortunately, he's unable to join us in person today. However, we are pleased to present the following short video that he prepared for this presentation entitled, California Dreaming, Brain, and Precision Medicine in 2018. And in addition, we have another special surprise. Dr. Collins' special bonus lecture for the NIH Brain Initiative for one of our most distinguished AAN members, Dr. Walter Karaschitz, Director of the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Francis Collins. Hello, all you California dreamers. I wish I was there with you in person to experience what I'm sure is going to be a very exciting meeting of the American Academy of Neurology in your 70th annual gathering. Unfortunately, other duties of the NIH director have intervened, and so I'm coming to you in a video. But you will be joined after I get through saying some things about precision medicine uh, by Walter Korschetz, who will talk to you about what we're doing with the Brain Initiative and other things that we thought this audience would be particularly interested in. So I would like to, without further ado, walk you through some of the aspects of precision medicine, and particularly those that are highly relevant uh, to neurology, and uh, at a very interesting time where I think uh, you will find this uh, to be mind-expanding in terms of where it might lead us in terms of research on virtually all diseases, but certainly including neurological conditions. So well, let's do this. As of course you know, NIH has a dual role. We both look at fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavioral living systems, that's our basic science mission, but also the application of that. And precision medicine fits into both those spaces. Precision medicine is an emerging approach to disease prevention that transforms a mostly one-size-fits-all approach of Western medicine into something that more focuses on individual differences. Of course, this is not an entirely new concept, but the idea of tailoring medical care to our unique medical selves uh, is something we've been striving for and yet oftentimes haven't really had the data to do this. So we want to consider not just genomics. This is not just about genomics. People tend to think if Collins is talking about it, it must be genomics. Well, it's in there, but there's a lot of other things here, too, lifestyle, environment. And of course, we have been doing this with blood transfusion or prescription glasses, but for an awful lot of medicine, we haven't really had the data to know how to do this. I've dreamed about this for some time, so have many other people, 
If you looked at this paper, and very few people did in 2004, it was an exhortation to begin in the United States a truly large-scale prospective cohort study of genes and environment that would collect data on hundreds of thousands of people over time and enable an understanding of how to prevent illness and how to manage chronic disease that we otherwise wouldn't have, building upon the success of other cohort studies going all the way back to Framingham, but doing this on a much larger scale and covering all diseases instead of having a specific disease focus. Uh, this didn't go very far because at the time it was utterly impractical. This table shows you where we were in 2004 versus where we are today, and certainly the drop in cost of sequencing, the speed with which that can be done, the use of cell phones to collect data and transmit it, and the availability of electronic health records and computing power makes what we were talking about 14 years ago now seem as though it might actually be practical. And so we are, in fact, going to embark very shortly on a program of this sort, of unprecedented scale. It's built upon other things that have developed, increasing enthusiasm on the part of participants in research that they want to be engaged, they want to be at the table, they don't want to be considered as human subjects, and they're interested in research that will involve learning about health, and not just about treatment of disease, but also about how to stay healthy. Electronic health records, as mentioned, providing a research tool, admittedly clunky, but one can get out of this some pretty useful information, and that's getting better all the time. New technologies, including wearable sensors and other ways to collect information on people about their environmental exposures, their health behaviors, and so on. And genomics, yes, in there as well, with all kinds of technologies, not just DNA sequencing, but also other kinds of omics that are increasingly affordable, even at very large scale. All of this presenting us with opportunities uh, in data science, which may be a little daunting, but are also enormously powerful and exciting in terms of the ways in which these kinds of data sets built on very large numbers of individuals with lots of medical information uh, can be subjected to advances such as machine learning uh, to understand inferences about causation that we otherwise would have had a hard time discovering. So all of that then motivating uh, us to do something dramatic as some other countries have been doing as well, but what about us here in the US? Here comes all of us, which is the Precision Medicine Initiative I wanna tell you about. This is an unprecedented program. It aims to deliver information on one million participants who will be enrolled over the course of the next three or four years, consented and engaged to provide data in an ongoing longitudinal basis, with high diversity in the participants, aiming to have half or maybe even a little more than half of these participants being those who traditionally have not been so involved in research, underrepresented groups. And also making the data accessible to a wide diversity of researchers so that anyone with a good idea will have access to this anonymized data set and be able to discover uh, connections that we might otherwise uh, take a long time to find out about. So that's the basic idea of the program. How do we actually do this? How do we recruit one million Americans to take part? As I'll tell you in a minute, we have been beta testing this now for almost a year. There are two pathways. One is a direct volunteer program <clears throat> where anybody in America uh, at the time of the launch and going forward after that can sign up. And that can be done over the web. It can be done by telephone. Basically what's required is a uh, series of questionnaires, an enrollment, a, a consent process, and some baseline physical measurements, access to electronic health records, and a blood sample and a urine sample, and at some point also the willingness to wear certain wearables uh, to be able to keep track of what's happening to that individual's uh, health situation. Another pathway forward is from those who are participating in a series of almost a dozen health care provider organizations who have agreed to be our partners and make available to their customers, their clients, their patients, the opportunity to join up. And that makes it particularly facile because in that situation, you will have already access to legacy data on that individual in terms of medical experiences, lab tests, and so on. 
So we have, as I said, already been testing this out. I'll show you shortly here how we've done already. It looks as if this strategy is going to be very well received by people who are approached about this. They're going to get a lot of information back about themselves. We're returning a lot of results. And people are actually quite motivated uh, to take part in a program of this sort. So why do we need this? We have a lot of other cohorts out there. Do we need one more? Well, this one's different and then all the rest. Certainly, again, this is intended to be a very diverse group. And actually, we're going to learn a lot about health disparities in this process. And we're going to learn about individual differences. We are also, I think, uh, interested in looking at all conditions, uh, not basically limiting this uh, to one subset of illnesses or one, one kind of medical question. So this should be of interest to professional providers as the data begins to come forward. And certainly for researchers, the idea that you'd have a foundational database of a million or more participants with all of this data already accumulated means that you could build on top of this a wide variety of other studies with highly motivated, pre-consented individuals who are happy to be recontacted about future studies. We could actually speed up the process of doing a lot of clinical research that now takes us a long time to get up and going. Well, what about neurology? Does this actually fit with the kinds of questions that you all at AAN are talking about? We actually have been asking that question of multiple disciplines, and we have gotten some pretty interesting responses from the neurological community. Because think about this. If you have a million people and you begin to look at brain disorders that occur at a certain frequency, well, you see the percentages on this slide for migraine, dementia, chronic pain, and so on. Uh, multiply those percentages times one million, you're going to have a very large cohort of these particular kinds of conditions. And this offers the opportunity to be able to quickly study those individuals already pre-enrolled, already with a lot of legacy data and with longitudinal data that will get collected over the years. Because as we ask people to join up, we're asking them to stay engaged, essentially indefinitely, over the course of time. This particular study is already funded by the US Congress for at least 10 years. So we have this confidence that this is going to be a stable way to gather that kind of data. And it will get better each year as the data sets expand. We held a workshop uh, back March 21 to 23, three very intense days. And in that workshop, we had a number of breakout groups that were being asked to think about use cases for this kind of a million strong study, if it existed, what would you think about doing with it? And one of those breakout groups was on sensory pain and neurological conditions. And here on this slide are a number of the things they came up with during the course of that three-day deliberation. And just imagine how this could be useful. This is a very short list of what I'm sure could be a much longer one. Could retinal imaging serve as a biomarker for neurodegenerative diseases? Because we could, in fact, add retinal imaging to a subset of these million people if we thought that would be useful, maybe even all of them if it was affordable. How could we track migraines and migraine treatment with wearable devices? Keeping track of what kind of response is happening in a way that acquires that real-time digital data. Could smartphones be used to assess cognitive ability over the lifespan? Uh, what factors influence optimal recovery from traumatic brain injury or stroke? And do statins actually affect the risk of neurodegenerative conditions, which is a hotly debated topic with a study of this magnitude and a longitudinal uh, pathway? We should be able to generate the kind of data that would be hard to achieve in other ways. Those are just five examples of use cases. Many more were talked about in the course of those three days. Uh, let me just sort of help you, though, think through how all of us could be utilized across this spectrum from discovery all the way to delivery, because it has potential in every one of those spaces. Certainly under discovery, one thing we may learn is by having all of this data on individuals with particular medical conditions is how our disease taxonomy could, in fact, be improved by identifying subsets of conditions that had not previously been apparent and that might have different natural history and different response to therapy. This has already been pointed to in an article in Science about whether psychiatry could in fact be greatly benefited by this kind of integrated data set 
where what we currently use as uh, major categories, such as major depression, mild depression, or bipolar depression, could, with integrated dis, uh, data, uh, ultimately separate out into data-driven categories that would be quite different, but would be very useful to know about in terms of likely response to therapeutics. In the area of discovering therapeutic targets, with genomic sequence on a very large number of individuals, we are probably going to uncover circumstances where there are protective factors against illness that could be one of the best clues we could get to new therapeutic strategies. The poster child of this is certainly PCSK9, this uh, remarkable story where individuals who are loss of function carriers for PCSK9 are protected against heart disease quite dramatically, have very low LDL levels, and are otherwise well. And of course, that has led to an enormously successful pharmaceutical industry effort to develop monoclonal antibodies against PCSK9 that appear to have a very important role in lowering cholesterol in people at high risk. Another example, perhaps more relevant to neurology, uh, the realization that people who have mutations in the sodium channel, NAV 1.7, have congenital insensitivity to pain, telling you that that is a great target uh, for a new pain medicine w w that we might want to explore. Furthermore, we're not only interested in maybe uh, the th causes that predispose people to illness, but also resilience. What is it uh, that allows people who you might think would have slipped into an illness uh, to remain healthy? And how could you take that information and transfer it more broadly uh, to people at risk? Genetic protective factors would be uh, one category, but protective factors in other sorts. Uh, the last example on this slide, does long-term caffeine use really reduce the risk of Parkinson's disease? There is some suggestion that's so. If so, uh, how does that work? Another area, pharmacogenomics. We really understand uh, a lot already about how DNA variations affect what happens when somebody receives a prescription, but we have not implemented that at scale uh, in almost any area because generally the doc doesn't have the genotype when the prescription needs to be written. All of us with a million people already genotyped, which is going to be part of this plan, and with that information available to the physician will be a test bed for figuring out does pharmacogenomics actually improve outcomes uh, in a large-scale, real-world situation. That should be one of the early benefits of having this program in place. And also just figuring out what works. There's an awful lot of stuff we do in the practice of medicine because we've always done it that way. Uh, maybe we have a chance to do it better. In this regard, I think the kind of monitoring systems that are going to be available, many of them already in hand and developing uh, rapidly uh, year after year, uh, should provide us with an opportunity to see what's really happening in, in real time uh, with a wide variety of body performance measures. And again, I think all of us is very well situated uh, to be a large-scale laboratory for testing uh, those kinds of gadgets uh, to see exactly what works. So I could go on, uh, but I need to make, make space uh, for my friend Walter. <laughs> again, just think about possibilities for all of us in behavioral research, in physical and neurological activity, in early detection and prevention, chronic disease management. If you had this million-strong cohort, all of the things that you could do, which could be done now much more cheaply and rapidly than having to start each project from scratch, this should be an opportunity to transform the way in which we do clinical research. But I know you could generate a lot more of those ideas, and hopefully at your meeting, uh, some of that will be a buzz that's happening in the hallways. And believe me, we're very interested in ideas because this particular program is getting ready to get started. I mentioned that we've been doing a beta test of this over the course of almost a year. What you see here is the number of participants that have signed up as part of that, uh, that test. Uh, we have not yet done the formal launch, but yet you can see over 30,000 people have created an account and uh, in, in consented, and in fact, almost 20,000 of those people have completed the full protocol, including the biospecimens, and are now fully involved in, in all of us. That's pretty impressive to have just a test pilot that includes almost as many people as originally signed up in Framingham. But again, we, we're, the goal here is to go to one million and that is coming soon. The national launch 
is spring of this year. It's already spring. So I think that tells you it's coming quite soon. Not yet ready to tell you the exact date, but it is coming soon enough that you will start to see evidence of it. And we expect to make a big national splash about this to try to encourage people across the country and all these various places, uh, different socioeconomic status, uh, different rural versus uh, uh, urban settings. We're not at the moment enrolling children, but we aim to start that next year after we're sure we have everything in place uh, with adults. Uh, this is going to be an amazing experience watching this take shape. And we're quite confident now, based upon uh, the beta testing, that all of the parts of this work well together. The biospecimen repository at the Mayo Clinic, all of the shipping that needs to happen, the databases, the security of the database system, which has been tested with penetration tests and hackathons, because that's rather critical. And the patient participation, where they, patients have been at the table throughout this, advising us about what kind of information they want to get back from this. And we aim to be right out in the very leading edge of return of results, because we think that's the right thing to do in a study of this sort. So all of this coming quite soon. Again, this is a big project with big potential. Lots of science, of course, gets done by investigators with hypothesis-driven ideas, and I think that's probably most of what you're hearing about at your meeting, and I strongly support that. But when you have projects of this sort that could, in fact, empower uh, lots of investigators to do things they couldn't otherwise, and when they become achievable, affordable, and create an opportunity for scientific pro progress, then I think we need to go forward. And that just brings me to a quote that I used to use talking about the Human Genome Project, but it seems to me it fits all of us just as well. Make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood and probably themselves will not be realized. Make big plans. Aim high in hope and work. That's very much what this Precision Medicine Initiative aims to do. And so, without further ado, other than encouraging you uh, to look at this slide and uh, watch for uh, blog entries from the NIH director and join up as one of my Twitter followers, all 85,000 of those, I'm going to now turn the podium over to a person who's not present uh, in a video form, but in a very a real presence, uh, that being the director of the National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Stroke, Dr. Walter Korchetz. Thank you all.